All right, so let's talk about a little more advanced networking. Okay. Uh, so first, let me start a terminal window. And I want to tell you how to find out what IP addresses your machine has. So I'm on this, uh, I happen to be on a Linux machine. If I were not, I would SSH into it. But anyway, I, I am on a Linux machine, okay? So the, in Linux, if you want to find out what networking, the first thing, you, the one command that you must know is ifconfig, which is interface configuration. Oh, <laughs> that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Okay. All right. So, yes. So I, I started a, let me, let me start over. Hold on. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can see it, but anyway, let me clear it and start over. Yeah. So in Linux, if you want to <coughs> find out what, uh, what inter uh, networking you have on this current machine, you run ifconfig, okay? So when you run if, ifconfig, it lists interfaces. You see that loopback, this is the loopback interface and uh, the, all the configuration of it. So some of this is mumbo jumbo even to me, but okay, this is quite obvious. This is the IP address. Uh, do you know what mask is? Well, mask, anybody wants to, try to explain what a mask is well basically it's like any a mask a person could wear but except if you apply this mask to this IP address and whatever is visible left visible is the subnet uh, the entire like prefix of the subnet subnet under which everything is addressable let me explain that for a second so the IP address is 127.0.0.1. So what is the subnet of that subnet as in which addresses are considered considered within the same uh, network? And the answer is what well, you basically put the mask on top of the IP address, which means, uh, you know, on bits and off bits, right? Off bits will turn, turn everything off, right? So you will be left with 127.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. Right, that that means the, all these zero digits are within the subnet. That means one twenty seven dot anything dot anything dot anything is within the reach of this network of this interface. So I don't know if that makes sense. Let me take that over here. So this is my Wi-Fi. Okay, if I apply this, so my IP address is one one ninety two dot one sixty eight dot one dot eighteen. Now, if you see the mask for that, it has a lot more ones, right? All the ones and then uh, eight zero, uh, uh, yeah, zero bits. So when you apply this mask, uh, uh, applying mask means and operator, bitwise and. So when you do bitwise and between this guy and this guy, what will you be left with? You will get 192 because all it's being ended with ones. So therefore it remains unchanged. Dot 168, again, the same reason, dot 1, dot 0. So that means uh, this network can reach one other, other, other computers that have the IP address 192.168.1 dot anything. So you should think of this, uh, wherever this, this 0 appears, the corresponding segment of the IP address as star or anything wildcard. So because there are three zeros here, that means all three of these can be anything. And that you are still within the same LAN, local network. And uh, here, uh, sorry, here only this digit, this uh, segment of the IP address can change and you are within the same uh, LAN. Does that make sense? So if, if that means, since this is the only one that can, that can change, that means if any of these can, if they changed, that means you're outside of your lo local network. So at that point, 
you cannot your nodes cannot talk to each other directly so uh, while you are within the same local network you can talk to each other directly like send packets to each other directly the minute you leave your network as soon as you are trying to talk to 192.168.2.22 or even 18 for that matter because this digit changed that's why you have to go through a gateway okay so now I introduced a new term called gateway. Uh, we will come to gateway. Basically, gateway is my router in this case. So how do I know which one is my gateway? I do net start minus R and R. So, so before I go there, let, let me finish what we are looking at. So two interfaces, two network in interfaces. Here's the IP address of the first one, IP address of the second one. That's the mask which determines who is local. And then there's the, the broadcast address which uh, let's not go into that yet. Uh, this, this is IPv6 IP address. I will not be able to talk about it because it's uh, beyond my pay grade. I really don't know a whole lot about IPv6 other than that it's 128 bit. That's all. So much bigger address space. Okay. All right, and it's other than that is statistics. This is all statistics. How many packets were sent and received? So we don't have to worry about that at least for this discussion. Now, let me show you uh, a slightly different example. If I go to my server one, and there if I say if config, I see uh, this Ethernet zero and loopback. So loopback is almost exactly the same as you might imagine. Loopback is loopback. It's within the same same machine. But look at this. This is the IP address and the mask is similar, which means anything which starts with 107.155.118 and this can be anything dot star that is within the same land, which means you don't have to go through a gateway. Once again, gateway is a computer that you send your IP packets to whenever you want to communicate outside of your local network, which means typically even internet, etc. Everything will go through that. Okay, so that is that much clear? Uh, does I, IF config make sense to you? Okay, so IF config has a few options. I think uh, minus A. It means show me all interfaces, even those that are not configured. If I do the same thing here. Uh, so what this one did was I said, show me all, including the ones that are not configured. And it showed me the same too. That means there are no hidden interfaces. But here, if I do AF config minus A, all right, well, same thing. I guess there are no hidden uh, interfaces. Like if I had ethernet, I don't have ethernet on this, uh, on this particular laptop. If I had Ethernet, I would see ETH0 somewhere as yes, the third interface and it would say I'm not configured. Okay. So that's all you need to learn about IF config. Just know that this is the command that tells you what networking interfaces are there. All right. Next, let's talk about netstat. Netstat is a very uh, interesting command. It is for network status. Okay. The only problem is that it is, it, it shows too much. In fact, it shows, most of it is, is, is filled with Unix sockets. And as, since we are talking about networking, we have no interest at all in Unix sockets. Okay. Now, remember yesterday when we were doing net, internet programming, TCP IP programming, uh, we had uh, uh, we, 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 I, I reminded you that sockets are an, a Unix concept, not a networking concept. Uh, but IP and IP ports, IP addresses, everything is networking concept. That's a TCP IP concept, uh, not just un, unique to Unix. Okay. Now these are all, Netstat is showing you all the uh, Unix sockets and I'm not interested in them. So uh, if I do that here in a remote server, if I say Netstat, I see quite a few Unix sockets still, but a bit, bit fewer. Why? Because this is 
this is a remote server headless server no 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 uh, you, no end user connecting to it that's why there are fewer while this one is uh, my laptop and since it has a GUI running and it has a bunch of other things running that's why there are so many unix sockets these are all local within the machine so since we are not interested in unix sockets at all what we should do is netstat minus t i think yeah t so it will show only tcp sockets okay and here netstat minus t shows tcp sockets so netstat is the other command that you should know in networking so okay so in net uh, so first we looked at if config now we are looking at netstat uh, like i said netstat minus t will keep you within the tcp ip realm which is where what you are mostly interested in now in here uh, netstat minus t is showing you every connection that is open currently open okay also the foreign address do you see how foreign address is always some kind of a name now that's okay but it slows everything down and a lot of times we are not interested in uh, names also even the port numbers are not shown as port numbers they are shown as HTTP, the port protocol default protocols running on those ports both are uh, at least for our purposes undesirable so let's do minus n n as in don't show me names show me numbers okay so now it's showing you numbers instead of names. So T for TCP and for numbers. Next, you want to, uh, so what it, it's not showing you the ports on which this local machine is just listening, although no one else is connected yet. So let me do that same thing, netstat minus NT, T and NT, same thing, okay. So only TCP and only numbers so this is not showing which port numbers am i listening on and that is often the most important thing when you're trying to troubleshoot network problems so uh, to to see that you have to say a a as in all show me all tcp ip ports where there is an active conversation happening like this one or all of these as well as those where there is a potential for a conversation because uh, I am listening, but no one is connected yet. And even if they are connected, I want to see that as a listening port. So as soon as I do NTA, that becomes far more interesting as you can see. Can anybody tell me what 0, .0, .0, .0, 0, .0, 0, 0.0.0.0 is? Can you tell Yeah, but local address I thought was 147.0.0.1, correct? So what does... Yes, it is, you're right, you're close. 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 is a, a, a placeholder or a stand-in or whatever, you is a wildcard for all local addresses, which means this guy had to remember a loopback as well as a public IP. So those two... So this this represents both of them, which means, which means that we are listening on port twenty two, and we will accept connections from local host uh, loopback that is, as well as from the one ninety eight whatever the other address was. Um, I, I guess it was one one o seven. Sorry, this this address one o seven address. This is the public IP address. So that means this is listening on all interfaces. On this machine. Now, do you know what port number 22 is? That's right, that's SSH. And now it's saying, I am simply listening. I'm not actually talking to anybody yet. No one is connected yet. But uh, my address is all my local addresses, port 22. I'm listening on it. And the foreign addresses is are anybody who comes. I'm fine with it and from any port now that is something you guys need to understand about network uh, about tcp ip and client server the server has a fixed port 
almost always but the client doesn't the client can come from any port uh, you might even ignore the concept of a port in fact you probably were not even thinking does the client need a port well it does so clients do need a port having said that the number port number doesn't matter at all why because client is coming in a client is trying to reach the server server is not trying to reach the client therefore server doesn't need to know where the like doesn't need to know it in at least in advance only after the connection is made then client, the server needs to know okay which port you are coming from because if i want to respond to it i have to send to that port right that's why the source the the client's uh, port number is immaterial in fact client's ip address is often immaterial too okay so that's net stat minus n as in numbers t as in tcp a as in all including so these are established connections as well as listening connections okay so if you see this one look this is port 25 anybody wants to tell me what port 25 stands for that's correct it is is smtp port number now did uh, so can can you read this and tell me what's going on anybody i'm mean, not just joy anybody who tell me how this ssh port versus smtp port are different no okay you you hopefully you notice the difference in the pattern here this is port 22 yes of course and this is port 25 fine but do you see the difference why they are listening on different different addresses and what difference uh, what what distinction will that cause this is listening on 0.0.0.0, .0 while this is listening on 127.0.0.1 what does that mean i want you to be to 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 tell me why that is remarkable why is it different why is that what difference will that make no huh? well ssh connections are going to be accepted coming in from outside or any place local as well as remote um, clients can connect to ssh port so which means i can do from S, uh, ssh i can say uh, connect to 127.0.0.1 that's so that's a, that's okay but that it's not a big deal anyways but the thing is even from a different machine i can say ssh to this uh, whatever the 107 this ip address and that will work too okay and that is because i am listening on all interfaces on the other hand smtp is listening only on loopback only on local loopback address that means uh, this machine although it has an smtp relay server running on it it will accept email outgoing emails only from the local machine it does not accept outgoing or incoming or any kind of emails from other machines on the public internet so that tells you that this smtp server is designed for outgoing email only it is not designed for incoming email because it doesn't even accept a connection from outside world does that make sense okay all right so now 443 who's that that's right and 80 you should now is yeah okay so this is https this is http as you might imagine http and https are for for the outside world therefore these are all uh, networking interfaces then 
you have these two uh, more loopback. I don't know what 4200 is. I Oh, this one is MongoDB, okay. 11211. That's MongoDB. This I don't know. But this one, you guys should recognize what that is. Ready 306. That's right. That's MySQL, correct. So, again, My, MySQL server is accepting uh, only local connections, local client. It is not even listening on the public internet port, which, by the way, is a very wise idea, very good idea. Because you don't want outside public internet people to connect to your, your database server, right? Your, your database clients are running on the same machine. You have Drupal or any other program, etc., that needs to connect to database will be running on the same machine here, server one itself, not outside server one. So that's why you are uh, leaving it like this. Now that, that poses an interesting challenge what if you wanted your SQL Pro or your Heidi SQL or your MySQL admin client to connect to this particular MySQL instance, which is going to be very difficult because your graphical client is running on your machine, but you want to connect to the MySQL server running on my on the server, and uh, the server is not listening on public internet. <clears throat> so how do you get around that? <clears throat> we will talk about that. The short answer, anybody wants to tell us? The quick answer is... Yes, it does. Specifically, port forwarding over SSH tunnels. That's So, yes. Uh, so, and we'll, we'll get into the details of that in a second. All right. So, let's... Uh, so that, that's my SQL listening on localhost only. This is MongoDB listening on localhost. This is HTTP, public IP address everywhere. This is not even a listening connection. This is an actual established connection. As in, uh, here is the remote machine that is connected to my public IP address on port 22. And the source port is 33,926. Any idea who this is? Well, that's me. <laughs> Remember, server one is not my laptop. My laptop is this sugar. Is my laptop. So this is this is the public IP address of sugar, and it's connecting to uh, this public IP address of um, whatever uh, the server one. Now, an astute observer would say, "Hold on, Jitesh." There, the public IP address of sugar, I never saw this, uh, this 199.168.188.155, that's not showing up anywhere here. So, anybody can throw some light on that mystery? What's going on? How? That's not my IP address. I, I can assure you that this is me connecting, okay? That much, uh, much is true. The question is, why is does it show this IP address that that is not one of my IP addresses? Because it is the IP address of my router. That's the public IP address that my internet service provider, Comcast or whoever, has assigned to my router. And this is the public IP address of, of my router. Now, and so this is another networking concept that you need to learn, which is NAT. N -A -T, network address translation. So, what is happening? What's happening is, uh, this uh, loopback address is, it doesn't play any role in this, so let's ignore that. This, my Wi-Fi got this 
address, right? IP address. This is LAN local IP address. Okay. It's good only for my LAN within my home. Okay. But uh, there is a router which is, uh, I can tell you how to find the router. Uh, you basically say netstat minus r and as in route, show me the routes. And it tells you the same netstat command tells you completely different information. And that is um, that when I want to go to 192.168.1. anything, I should send packets to no gateway at all, which means I should be sending my packet directly to whichever the, the target address is. It's 169, I don't know what that is, ignore that. But, so other than these two uh, subnets, right, if I want to send, if, if these two don't match, and I want to send my packets to, let's say 107.155.118, dot 54 then th th these two subnets don't match so that that leaves only this guy and that i should send to a gateway known as 192.168.1.1 that is my router okay what this uh, so this is the routing table basically okay so the routing table is saying that whenever you want to send your packets to anything uh, uh, that doesn't match this subnet or this subnet, that means you have to use this route. And this route says everything goes to the same place, 192.168.1.1, which is my router. Now, my router has two IP addresses. One is inward looking, local IP, looking into the LAN, looking at my laptop, I guess. And that is this IP address. So I, when I want to send packets to my server one, I send those packets first. I, I put the address of server one on the packet and then I send it to my local um, router. That local router takes those packets and then sends it out to that, to this place eventually. And when it is received by this uh, server, it sees only the public IP address of my router and does not see the LAN IP address of my laptop. Why? Because of NAT. So network, so, and that is, that's a good thing by the way. The reason why that's a good thing is because now you can you can be allocated one public IP address. Your your router is given a single public IP address, and with that single public IP address, you can have any number of such um, laptops or desktops or other devices, even phones, etc., on behind your router be, uh, within your local Wi-Fi, and all of them can now communicate with public internet without ever being exposed themselves to the public internet. So they all have private IP addresses. So this is, these are private IP addresses. Your, uh, you know, I have four phones, five, five or six phones in the household. All of them have, have this 192.168.1. something IP address. Mom, all the laptops, all the iPads and all the desktops, all of them have one of these uh, addresses, right? And I do not need, need 10, 15 different IP, public IPs. I have only one public IP, this one. And all my com outgoing communication to the public internet uh, gets network translated, network and goes, get na as they call it, natted. Okay, it gets natted through my router. And, and all the traffic that comes out of my household uh, looks like coming from this IP. And therefore, these servers, these outside parties out on the public internet send their responses back to the same public IP address. But when they send it, they send it to, uh, they're sending it to this uh, port number, 
or or when the when the address was coming when the traffic was going out of my laptop it puts a certain marker some kind of a session id or some number on it some tag on it so that when the router receives it okay when the response comes back basically any kind of response comes back from the public internet to the router the router looks at some nat headers on it and it realizes that this response is it could be for any of the 15 devices in my household but then because it is natted properly it has a nat header on it which ties it back to my ip address whatever that, uh, sorry this ip address so take a moment to absorb that information Okay, very good, very good question. Okay, yeah. So this number is the IP address that my router is using. So if I, or it could even be, so let, let me back on my laptop. Remember, this is my, this is my laptop connecting you know, on SSH, right? So if I back on my laptop, if I say netstat minus NTA and grep for um, whatever, 107, right? Because that's what I'm connecting to. So there, that is the 22, port 22, right? Of the other end. And this is 3926. This is the port number that my laptop is using for out, to send the communication, to send the SSH packets. And it, it picked this port number totally randomly because it has absolutely no preference as to which port it sends from. Because clients sending ports are insignificant. Servers receiving ports are very important. Because the communication is always started by the client to the server. Therefore, server must have a known IP address and a known port number. While, so so the, this one matches this one. While this one matches this one. Now, again, so 33926 was a randomly picked selected port by my laptop's IP stack. So, but, but, but the IP address doesn't match as you can see. My, this is not the IP address you're seeing here. Why? Because it is, it's been replaced by the public IP of my router. And that's because of NAT. Make sense? All right, so again, to reiterate, NAT is a special feature of uh, I TCP IP that came along a little bit later than initial uh, TCP IP because uh, people realized that, hey, uh, if I want to, I, if I want my laptop to connect to any website, should I be on public internet? Should I expose my my laptop directly to the public internet? That seems a little scary. That I don't want anybody. I'm not a server. I'm only a client. I'm always a client. I'm never ever a server. So if I never want to be a server, why should I even have a public IP address? Because if I have public IP address and by mistake I am running some program on my laptop that listens, then by mistake my laptop could get hacked, could get compromised in some ways. So that is one concern. The second concern is, uh, I have a router and, sorry, I have a, a, an internet connection from my provider, let's say Verizon or Comcast or whoever, right? I have that, but I, I want to, I want to pay for only one connection, uh, but I don't want to uh, pay for all the 10 devices that I have in my house uh, and they don't all so how do I how do I pay for one connection well the answer is you get only one IP address for your router and then behind that router public IP address there will be a private LAN and within the private LAN you can have as many devices as you want and they all 
simply send their packets uh, to the to the gateway, the router. The router repackages them with NAT headers on it, sends them out to the public internet. When the public internet responds back, they are told to send it back to the router instead of the laptop to the same port. When it arrives at the router, it unpacks the NAT header and figures out that, oh, this packet is really meant for this guy. This laptop. Okay. So I hope uh, the second round of NAT uh, explanation hopefully sticks a little bit better. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now, uh, now that we understand what is netstat, what is if config, what oh, how NAT works, network address translation NAT works. Um, let's. Uh, uh, we saw two incarnations of netstat. One was netstat uh, by itself, which shows every everything, all all sockets alive. So we said netstat minus t to show me only TCP socket. Then it was showing. Um, It was showing uh, minus. Uh, so it was showing names like host names and uh, as well as the, what's the other thing? Um, port numbers were replaced by port protocol names. So you put n, and it then it was not showing the listening ports. It was showing only connected ports. So you, you say a. So that gives you. Sorry. Yeah, that gives you both connected ports. As well as listening ports. Okay, then we saw a slightly different, completely different incarnation of uh, netset, which is minus r. That is, show me routes. Again, if you show routes, it it will it will use these kinds of uh, funky names that don't make a lo lot of sense. Okay, so to one second. So, where was I? Yeah. So, in order to um, in order to see numbers instead of these names, just say minus. Sorry, not m. My bad. N. Yeah. So that shows you routing table. Routing table again is important if you really want to learn networking seriously. So you need to know how your packets will get routed. The packets get routed based on the net mask. Okay. So if you are trying to communicate within this subnet, that's the uh, route that will be used. The important thing is that there is no gateway, which means direct communication. If you want to send packet within this sub subnet, uh, again, did you see, notice how I am not selecting the last two at this time because the last two are zeros. Then you will use the same um, address, the same this interface and no gateway. If you want to send and if of course, if you want to send it to to look at the uh, mask is 0, 0.0, which means anything, any address, right? then you will send all the packets to 192.168.1.1. That's the gateway. And you'll do it using this same uh, subnet. Uh, not sub interface, yes. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. You are absolutely right. And and this is this is link local. I will be very honest and tell you that I don't know what that is. I have never used it for any purpose. And uh, I understand this one. This is my private LAN. This is public. While uh, the problem is this one is, is not even a 127 or loopback address. This is link local, whatever that means. I think... I think this is 
for this i i think this ip is used for when dhcp to to obtain a dhcp address i don't know for sure though so i will figure out what uh, I'll, I'll research that and tell you guys but for now please ignore the link local one uh, i don't really know what that does really okay i know for sure uh, one thing i know one thing for sure this 169.254 address i've always seen it uh, to be there even before you connect anything even before you connect to wi-fi this is always there if before you uh, if this was an ethernet physical ethernet cable uh, slot but this link uh, local address will will already be there even before you connect so i so because of that my guess is that this is the IP, this is what allows uh, you to obtain a dhcp address which is 192.168.1.18 in my case so that is my guess okay i don't know for sure all right so so we saw netstat minus nta and netstat minus r and so routing okay these two are important now let's do one more thing netstat minus nta p why is why p p means show me the process id that is listening on that port number so without that what you see is okay someone is listening on 3306 but it doesn't tell, tell you who and a lot of times you need to know who is listening you know for security purposes or some troubleshooting or whatever right so nta p now when you do p you it will tell you that not all processes could be identified non-owned process info will not be shown okay so that is why it didn't tell me what who's listening on this 3306 in fact it did not tell me uh wait oh no it did it told me this see it told me all about my chrome processes uh, process id 2695 it told me about my SSH client process because that is owned by Jitesh, the user. It did not tell me about MySQL. Why? Because only root should be able to know such information. So that's why I should run netstat minus ntap with a pseudo prefix. Does everybody know what pseudo is? Uh, oh, okay, let me ask. Is anybody here? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Anybody who doesn't know what sudo does? Okay. Yeah. So sudo means uh, do as the super user, meaning to say run this command as if you are root. Temporarily, it will turn, uh, you know, convert your process ID, your, your user ID or user identity to root. And then it will run this process as root. Okay. So I do that. It asks me for my password. Of course, it's asking me for my password, not root's password. Because I have pseudo permission, I just need to prove it again that I am Jitesh. Now, once I did that as sudo, uh, you see it does this. By the way, this is actually behind. Like, okay, let me uh, make it a little bigger and now. Yeah, this will, okay, or let me just make it as super big, yeah. Yeah, that's more readable, okay? So here, TCP, that's 3306, and this is MySQLD is the name of the process, and 1421 is the process ID. On port 80, the process that is listening is nginx minus g daemon, and this is basically the, the some options also, but the process ID is this. On port 53, DNS mask is listening and so on and so forth. I mean, I don't have to go through each one of them. And it seems that there is somebody listening on port 22, which is SSHD. So it's allowing incoming connection. That's my laptop allowing in incoming connections. Okay. So that's the minus P option of Netstat. I hope that was useful because it will become useful when you have to troubleshoot you are trying to bind to, let's say you want to bind your process to, uh, uh, to port 80, okay? And then 
some uh, you in the nginx or apache is not able to bind to port 80 uh, because it says address is already in use and then you're scratching your head why is the address already in use who is listening it will say yes address is in use someone is listening on port 80 but for the life of me i cannot figure out who is it so therefore i do uh, net start minus ntap with a pseudo prefix and then it tells me, oh, it's port, uh, it, it, this is Tomcat or Java or, uh, you know, process ID so and so. And that, that gives you a little clue. And then you can track it down and then shut down Tomcat or whatever. Make sense? Okay. So, netstat minus rn, netstat minus ntap. And then if config. Let's go to the next tool in the toolbox. That is, uh, that's actually a much simpler one. Host. This is for host name lookup. You just give a host num name, and it brings up the IP address. So similarly, if I said, you know how when I uh, I have uh, like I go to, you guys have seen me use default dot. Uh, d8 jitesh.d8.so1.spinspire.com like that so if i if i take that as the I, as the host name and if i say look up that host name so you do that it says that this name default.jitesh.d8.server1.spinspire.com is an alias to another name and that is server1.spinspire.com and server1.spinspire.com as a name is, an, is actually pointing to a number, IP address. So it's a two level uh, indirection. Like, you know, first you do this name to name, and then you do name to number. Okay, so it's just telling you what. So from our session yesterday, you should know that uh, the type of uh, DNS records each one represents. Anybody wants to remind me? Correct, that's right. Name to name is a C name record on, in the DNS server, while name to IP address is an A record. The record type is A, okay, that's good. All right, now, uh, so that's host. There is another similar command called dig. Dig does the same, roughly the same thing. Uh, and it's just more verbose, it's more detailed. So dig will say, I don't even know how to read it. Uh, it says answer section. Yeah, you see that? How it says C name. This is more 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 wonky, right? So this is C name, and then it shows the A A record right there. So dig is far more technical, basically, I guess. All right, makes sense. That's the A record, and that's the C name record. And it's a little bit harder to read, but it has more information. So that's dig. Um, okay, next. Uh, ns lookup is the older command. Ns lookup is another way to look up things. Uh, name server lookup. Okay. And that gives you slightly different information. If I say, uh, yeah, look me up this, okay. Then it says, the DNS server that I'm querying is localhost, Alma, 127.0.1.1, did you notice? Which is another loopback address, okay. And on that, port 53. Do you remember DNS mask was running on it? Let me show you. Next stat minus NTAP. So you see on this port, somebody is listening and that is DNS mask. 
So that's my local locally running name server. It doesn't serve name really it's just a proxy name server it simply looks up from the out, outside world and keeps it cached for me so that i uh, it doesn't take that long for me to keep i mean i don't waste a lot of time doing lookups it does the lookup once and keeps it handy cached okay so so it's a so an ns lookup said uh, i ran ns lookup and then i gave it a host name it said i am this is the guy i'm querying and it is giving me a non-authoritative answer. What does that mean? That means uh, I'm telling you to the best of my knowledge, this may or may not be absolutely true because I'm not, I am just a local DNS mask server. I don't really know for sure if this is the one, but this is pretty good, good enough. It says uh, this name has an, is an alias to this cano canonical name. And then that name is pointing to this address. Now, you could say, you could change the name servers. You could say ns equals, sorry, uh, server equals, I think, 8.8.8.8. .8 That's the Google IP address. Wait, where is this? Sorry. Uh, there is some syntax, which, sorry, I don't remember the syntax, but there is a way to say that use this server. I don't know if you know that 8.8.8.8 is Google's public DNS server. Also 8.8.4.4, those two. Anyway, but I, I, I don't remember the syntax by which I can use Google's server and that will give me a different answer. Eventually, if you want an authoritative answer, a really sure shot authoritative answer, you, uh, you should uh, wait. You should go to the name server of that domain, whatever it is. So let me see. Non authoritative. This is still giving. Non -authoritative. Ah, uh, no. Sorry, never mind. That still didn't give me. I'm sorry, I, I forgot how to how to find the authoritative answer. Basically, authoritative answer is the is the you know authoritative, meaning say it's guaranteed to be true. It is uh, because who knows about where uh, what server one dot dot com should point to? Well, spinspire.com knows, right? So whichever um, DNS server spinspire.com has assigned as this it's authoritative name server it is the one who knows and it to and, and that can be shown by going to my name registrar name silo.com and I log in and I don't remember what the password is hopefully it will work no okay yeah this one worked so here, if I go to my domain manager and go to spinspire.com, so there it is. That's my no, uh, did it, okay. That's my name server. This is my name server. ns1.dnsowl.com, ns2.dnsowl.com, and ns3.d. These are my authoritative name servers, which means whatever information these three servers will give you is the most current and unexpired information. Okay. Does that make sense? So if I if you want to see my spinspire.com entries, then the, there it is, server one. Server one is the entry. Right. And here's the IP address it points to. Now it doesn't say so server one dot spinspire.com because we are <coughs> this this whole thing is about spinspire.com. So the domain itself is not listed. As I told you earlier, dot com is the TLD. TLD stands for yes, top level that's right, top level domain. This is the domain. So spinspire.com is the domain and dot com is the TLD. And then 
After that, if you want, everything else is within the namespace of spinspire.com. So you read this as server1.spinspire.com, server5.spinspire.com, and so on and so forth. So these are A records, as you can tell, because they are from name to number. So these are a bunch of A records. Uh, well, this one too. Then from that, once you're, you're done with your A records, you probably will have a few C name records because M, because here, mweb dot .spinspire.com points to server 8 dot .spinspire.com. Okay, so right hand side is not always assumed to be um, spinspire.com. That's why it's fully qualified. For example, my SMTP do API domain key points to dkim.sendgrid.net, which is outside of spinspire.com. Anyway, so, so yes, so then mweb is a C name to server 8. Then star.mweb is a C name to mweb.spinspire.com, which kind of makes sense, right? But you do have to specify star dot. It, these things are not automatic. So this is a wildcard entry. So anything dot server one points to server one. Anything dot server five points to server five. Anything dot server eight points to server eight, and so on so forth. So an important one is what about spinspire.com itself? Okay, and meaning to say. Where should spinspire.com itself take you if you type spinspire.com in there? And you will notice that where is it? Do we have any anything that says spinspire.com? We don't, right? Right. But that's C name. Look, but here this is a special one. Do you see how host name has nothing in it? That's the domain itself, which means nothing dot spinspire, which means spinspire.com. So when you're adding, you can add, so in that situation, you add at or nothing, just omit it completely. And uh, so if I, if I edit this one, you see how it is actually empty. You leave it empty. Some, some no name providers will require you to put at sign here. And that means nothing. Somehow, so the so what I'm saying is that my domain itself, spinspire.com, is an A record pointing to whatever this is, and this, by the way, happens to be same as my server five. Now, an astute observer would say, "Hold on, Jitesh, how come? Shouldn't you then?" If, if you want to make server 5 uh, the main spinspire.com server, should you make this a C name? And say nothing.spinspire.com points to points as a C name to server 5. Wouldn't that make things more smooth and streamlined where you don't have to uh, uh, repeat the IP address? That is correct. I should have done that, except one problem. The primary primary domain records are not allowed to be C names. They have to be A records. That's right. Now one could say, maybe then I should have done the opposite. Maybe leave this as A record and turn server five into, into a C name to spinspire.com, right? That would be fine too. That's a, that's a correct observation. And in fact, it would allow that, but I don't want that. I want my server names to be always A records. That way I can tell, you know, what IP address is what server. I, there is a little bit of confusion here. When I look at this one, I have to, I have to pause for half a second and say, oh yeah, that's server five. But that's okay. All right. So, uh, when I'm managing my DNS, I basically, most of the time I'm adding A records or C name records. In fact, I'm adding far more C name records than A records. Then there is MX records. So 
in my slideshow, I had talked about A records, C name records, and even TXT records, if you remember, which of which I have a couple. Okay, these are just in general, these are like, for example, this is a public key for my domain. So let's not go there. Uh, it would take me too much time to explain those. But MX record is something you should understand, at least at a very high level. MX stands for Mail Exchanger. Okay. So these, what that means is when someone wants to send, uh, um, and by the way, it's empty. When it's empty, it means pinspire.com. So when somebody wants to send an email to anything at spinspire.com, they should talk to one of these guys. And they have priorities. So top priority, this guy. First, talk, try to reach this guy. Second, try to reach one of these two guys. They are both five, priority number five. And then finally, try to reach one of these guys. They are, they are priority 10. So that's the priority. This is priority call. So, uh, which means that when somebody wants to send an email to jitesh at spinspire.com, they should connect to this server using SMTP, um, I guess on port 25, but then Google doesn't accept anything on port 25 because it, it believes in secure communication. Therefore, port number 587 is the for S, for, for secure SM, SMTP. SMTP over TLS, I guess. So, so therefore, it will connect to that host port 587. That's how all emails are routed. So, th then what happens is somebody sent an email to chitesh at spinspire.com. They do a look MX lookup first and then uh, I mean, they don't, I mean, the person doesn't, but their mail agent does, a mail sending agent, mail, mail program does. It then connect, finds that this is the relay server, this is the server where the mail should be sent, it connects there, sends the email, so this server receives it and the email shows up in my Gmail. Okay, makes sense. So you guys basically have to, now you know A records, CNAME records, TXT to some extent, I guess, MX records, you know, routing, uh, basics, at least very, very fun, basic, basic level routing of NetChat minus R and at least you understand uh, the, how to look at what ports are being listened for and what ports are connected. You can see what process and process IDs are connected to it. You can see what IP addresses I have. You can see how you learned how to look up host names with host or dig or NSLOOK. Okay. Some more networking tool. And now as we are progressing, we will get a little more advanced and all that. So I think it's all good. Finally, I wanted to tell you a little bit about firewalls. I will not go very deep into the firewalls because that can be a very big topic. Uh, but just yesterday when we were running our server, if you remember, we ran the server and the server was running and then we ran the, the client, tried to connect and the client got stuck, hung and the server was not noticing at all that the client actually came. So yeah, let me show you uh, the situation again. Dev Python server is running now. And I say that yeah. So now if I run the client, you see it's connected, connecting to server one dot com port ten thousand. This guy says I'm in server one, but I am listening to port thousand. But these two are not talking to each other yet. Why? Because there is a firewall. So I had to kill this guy, kill this guy. And 
the firewall is in my case it's called ufw uncomplicated firewall if i say ufw status it says oh you need to be root it's okay sudo ufw status so this is what it's doing it's saying i allow port 22 i allow port 80 i allow 443 anything else i'm going to drop your package will go into the black hole and I will not even bother to tell you about it. So, and that is by design. That's one purpose. You don't want to respond. If this is to save you from, from IP level attacks, also known as DDoS attacks, right? So if you started telling everybody that, oh, sorry, I cannot accept your packets because you are a spammer. So then they will send you more packets and you, you'll, you'll spend all your network bandwidth in just responding to them. That's the reason why firewalls, when they drop packets, they just drop it. They don't actually say why I'm dropping it. And that's what will happen in this case. And that is exactly what was happening here. We were connecting and it was just dropping. So to, uh, to, so that's the only thing I'm going to, uh, UFW is something that you should know that it exists. And when you get around to setting up a, a server, you will end up learning it. And the configuration, by the way, is an etc ufw and I guess um, ufw.conf, I suppose. No, that's not where it is. Uh, somewhere, um, I don't know, applications.de, yeah. So yes, so these are the applications that are allowed, I suppose. So there it is, Nginx, yep. port 80 is allowed, port, port 43. These are the applications that we have told UFW about and said, hey, don't mess with these, leave them alone. So port 80 and port 40, 443, it picks up and says, I want you to allow, uh, to allow them, don't mess with these. And then next, is another SSH, open SSH server, it says port 22, leave it alone. But that's why uh, when you run UFW status, which is this, it says that I'm going to allow these and everything else I'm going to drop. So, uh, in order for our client server program to work, all I will do is I just say, um, sudo service ufw stop so this is another unix command that you should be very familiar with is service service name and then some control command like start stop restart or status so the, here i'm saying i want to control a service the name of that service is ufw and i want the control command i want to send is stop so it stops that now, if you do sudo ufw status inactive, right? So now, when I run my server and I run the client, they're talking to each other, right? So I'll run the client again. It's working. Okay. All right. So that is uh, basically ufw. That's all I can tell you about ufw at the moment. Ufw just Make note of it. Uh, don't have to learn it, learn it right now. Learn it when you need to learn it. Okay. All right. I will restart my service. And now, once again, status shows its activity. All right. Yes. Firewall. So UFW is basically a uh, uh, an interface on top of IP tables or IP chains, is it? I think so. IP chains and IP tables are low-level uh, commands within Linux uh, that uh, that do some kernel and uh, TCP/IP level uh, magic. But that would be too complicated for us. Unless we are full-time networking professionals, we don't need to learn that. So, to remove that complications, the complication, 
and they came up with u f to the uncomplicated firewall, which is basically just a higher level interface on top of IP tables and IP chains. Okay. Right, so I, I will stop here and I want to want you to ask whatever questions because I'm sure your head is spinning by now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is very important because a lot of people will not type spinspire.com into their browser. They are used to typing www.spinspire.com. So, therefore, I need to have a some some uh, thing for www. And uh, so, what I'm saying is, when somebody is looking for www.spinspire.com give them the IP address of spinspire.com, the domain itself, which is this guy. Does that answer the question? Okay. Now, there's one more thing. Uh, now, since you asked the question, when you do type www.spinspire.com, and I press enter, it goes to spinspire.com. It takes off the www. Is that because of the CNAME? Well, since I'm asking the question, it cannot be a simple answer, right? So, no, it's not because of the C name. It, if this was, if there was only the C name in the picture, then you would, yes, you would see this website, yes, but you would, but then it would leave dub 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 in alone. It would simply send your packets to the same IP address as spinspire.com, and but you would still your browser would not remove dub 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 from it. And the reason why that is happening is because I have configured my, my HTTP server Nginx to redirect you to spinspire.com when you come looking for www.spinspire.com. So let me, sh let me show exactly in this Chrome uh, network console. So here I am typing www.spinspire.com. I press enter and uh, it okay sorry it did not show the redirection because it it clears so what i will do is i'll clear this i'll say preserve log so if i turn this on it keeps the log uh, it doesn't clear the log when the page reloads okay so now and i will also disable cache because i don't want uh, i want this thing to happen from the first principles from scratch. Okay, so now I press enter. All right, let's see what's going on. Cancelled, you see how this is cancelled? Why is it cancelled? I don't know why it's cancelled. Right, this is, uh, okay, let me clear my cache. I even did disable cache, so I don't know. But I'm I'm pressing Control Shift Delete to clear cache. Okay. Now I clear this, and I once again type up to Damn it! It's not showing me the redirect. Okay. Redirecting navigation because the server presented a certificate valid for spinspire.com but not for www. Oh. To disable such redirects, launch Chrome with the following flag force field trials. Ah. Okay, so that means thank you, thank you, Mish, for pointing to me. That means I have a problem, I have an issue, I need to fix this. Uh, this means that anybody who is typing www.spinspire.com 
but not using Chrome is probably getting an a a SSL error, HTTPS error, because this the certificate is not valid. All right. So, but if I say, okay, what about HTTP? Okay. If I do that, let's see what happens. Let me clear this first. Okay, now. Oh, damn it. I forgot. Wait, the redirection? Where is the redirection? Oh, same thing. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know what to say. Uh, so, yeah, so basically, okay, the, the long and short is that my, my production server, which is server 5, okay, has. Sorry, it's enabled. This one. A. Oops. No, not that. Sites. This one, it has a redirect from www. There is a redirect. I'm sorry, I, I don't know where it is. But um, there is a redirect basically. So uh, I'm almost sorry now that I brought this up because I'm not able to provide a good explanation. In a, in, well, well, suffice it to say, this is doing things only at IP level. It is not interfere at HTTP level. Okay. So see, so then. At HTTP level, I have a redirect from www.spinspire.com to spinspire.com. And that is what is causing the change in address. Okay. I, I'm sorry if I confused you even more. This will simply, whatever packets you send to www, when you, when you try to look up, sorry, when you, whenever you try to look up www.spinspire.com, it will give you the IP address of spinspire.com. Okay, and that's how you end up in the same place. But your browser address bar will remain with www. But because I have nginx HTTP level redirection also enabled, that's what says you're looking. You you want to see the website for www.spinspire.com, but it has been moved to spinspire.com please go and request http make a http request to spinspire.com and you'll see the real site that's why and, and your browser issues a second second request okay. all right what else any other question E, no, I mean, security is far more advanced than what we did. Uh, so what we did is I want, so yes, this is, this is stuff that you need to know as a developer, not as IT security professional, because if you were an IT security professional, you would do, go much deeper than this. But as a developer, you need to know that there is a firewall. Okay. And you know, the other day we got stuck and we, you know, I knew that there is a firewall or there is such a thing as a firewall and that could be interfering, right? So, and you will, I mean, if I were not there, you would be facing that problem and you would be scratching your head, why the heck, right? So you need to know that there is a firewall. You need to know what, how to bring that firewall down and, and let this run. Or if you want to make a permanent opening in the firewall, how to do that? Um, similarly, 
if, if you like i gave you another example a minute back that you you start your apache or nginx server and it says fail to bind to port 80 some address already in use so which means that somebody is already using port 80 is listening on port 80 and you want to know who who, who is it well you run netsat minus ntap and it gives you the process id and the process name so that again you are doing that as a developer not as a system administrator or a security professional okay so yeah in fact in fact joey you asked me that a similar question earlier you were saying that um one of the yeah question i think he was asking was um do we need to know all these things uh, something like that I, Yeah. Oh, yes. Request headers. So his his question was about HTTP request headers. Yeah. Request and response headers. And I. So he said, uh, "Do will we ever have to deal with it?" And I said, "Oh, absolutely. In fact, as a web developer, uh, you will have to uh, deal with headers. You need to know what headers are, what they mean. And not only that, you would need to know some, um, most of the commonly used headers. You know what is content type, what is content length, what is accept header, what is expires header, what is a cache control header, what is, um, you know, host header, and what is authorization header. So all those headers you will actually be using. Or if not necessarily writing code to generate or parse the headers, you will at least be affected by these headers. And if you don't know, uh, if you don't understand the headers, then you will be affected by something that is invisible, right? And, you know, like anybody who, who is affected by things but cannot see them, they attribute those problems to ghosts and, you know, spirits. So you don't want to be the, that person. All right. What else? All right. So we can we can stop here.